Femnet has continued to live out this phrase to its fullest by bringing along women in all their diversities as they work to mobilize, inform, influence and amplify Africa women's and girls' voices to collectively demand for accountability and tangible transformation in societies. So in the last three years, we've really seen Femnet transitioning um, from, from uh, just talking about gender issues to be more bold and unapologetic around taking a feminist agenda and actually saying the F word uh, to, to everyone and saying this is how we identify. I think internally as a secretariat, we have seen ourselves going through the African Feminist Charter to be able to understand it, to align ourselves to it, so that the work that we do in supporting and facilitating and catalyzing um, meaningful participation of our members, we are able to do that with a feminist lens. I think the boldness of Femnet has really stood out in the last couple of years in terms of getting into uncharted territories, doing some amazing groundbreaking work. And a case that I have in mind is working with horticultural farms, the women who are working in the flower farms in this country and being able to give them a voice, strengthening their leadership capacities, um, allowing them to start taking those positions and demanding for workplaces that are equal, that are responsive, but also those that also recognize the uniqueness that they bring into the market. The appreciation of the work that we do uh, as Femnet, I think they have been um, uh, increasingly, there, there is recognition uh, of engaging Southern organization, uh, especially organization that um, from the global south. And we all know, for example, it's hard to find organization that are multi-country and pan-African uh, in the global south. So most of organizations that are operating in, in, in Africa, for example, doesn't have their origin in the continent. And, and most of women's rights organizations are confined within specific communities or specific countries. So there have not been a lot of organizations that operate at regional spaces and hence engaging at the global processes in global space. So I think there is huge recognition of the work that Femnet does in terms of connecting the, glo uh, connecting the global, regional and local realities. And because that has been quite a missing piece and the struggle to most organizations to understand and, and feed this void between the local realities, but also what is happening in the regional uh, and the, the global spaces. The assumption going in is that women rights organizations are capacityless, and so people go in assuming that they need to do all these things to build their capacities. But the truth is we just need to enhance those capacities, we need to strengthen those capacities and that's the language we should be using when we are working with women rights organizations. We are seeking to strengthen what is already existing and we can do this by ensuring that not only do they have money to do what they, you know, they know how to do best, but they have money to exist past the doing. One of the things that has stood up within the sexual productive health rights is that uh, we know Femnet is a network organization. So we've been working with our members and partners in different countries to ensure that their voices are heard in different policy and advocacy spaces. So we've been able to mobilize and influence different women to articulate SRHR issues in these spaces and also for their voice to be heard and their issues to be addressed in the different policy and advocacy platforms. In her spearheading thought leadership in Africa, Femnet interrogates and delivers programs that are not only relevant to communities, but they address gaps that have existed for years. Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights, SRHR, is one of those programs. Femnet developed, adopted, and is implementing a men-to-men -men strategy, which is a tool for engaging religious and cultural leaders in advancing SRHR and ending violence against women and girls. What has been outstanding is seeing the path 
uh, of growth and transformation in men. And what has also been very outstanding for me is that being able to influence religious and cultural leaders to become now the champions in their communities uh, who are leading communities uh, towards uh, ending harmful cultural practices, ending gender-based violence and preparing the community to lead the life of a human rights um, uh, environment. I think for me what really lights up my work, um, our MNE approaches are feminist. Um, just to say that uh, we are very careful about how we collect data, just ensuring that uh, our processes are intersectional, they are inclusive, so that how we are communicating change actually reflects the lived realities of women and girls across the continent. Actually, the thirst and the growth for women's rights organization branching into actually looking at women's economic justice and rights. The thirst for knowledge and also the engagement and the capacities of women taking up different thematic areas, whether they're looking at public debt, for example, from a feminist lens, whether they're looking for conversations on how macroeconomic policies on service delivery, such as education, healthcare, we are actually having more women's rights activists come out and be actually engaged at the macroeconomic level. This has really been such a great retrospect for us, all the way from starting from as little as 25 uh, women to actually building to over 180 women who have come out of the AFMA program and are implementing and working within macroeconomic policies to date. So looking back from where we, we, we are coming from, where women were caged um, on domestic roles, uh, and seeing the progress that women are, you know, are making, uh, including being in very high-level political decision-making spaces, that is a win for me. And I think the whole world celebrated when we first had uh, the Vice President of United States of America. And recently, you know, having uh, East Africa having the first woman president, uh, President uh, Samia Suluhu, was a huge, huge, huge milestone for Africa. And that just shows that women are no longer caged in small circles. Women are coming out to occupy their space because they have an understanding of what gender equality means. And if I could reference uh, what um, Antonio Gures uh, mentioned during the Generation Equality Forums, which was also a, a, a big, big milestone for, for the gender equality agenda this year, is that gender equality is a 50-50 thing, and women, we don't have to wait for it to be given to us. We have to come out and you know grab that space and be there in the leadership. In its work locally, regionally, and at a global level, FEMNET continues to have an impact that is gaining global recognition. Uh, one of my pr proud moments has been the fact that FEMNET was uh, voted one of the best activist organizations globally in the entire world in terms of how we do our policy advocacy work and how we are very true to our mission in just ensuring that we are seeing um, to policy processes that are ensuring that women live um, in uh, dignity and that our, their lives are really changing um, for the better. One of the greatest impact has been uh, having a vibrant digital presence, one that has come very handy in this COVID-19 times. Um, from the onset, we were able to even have heart-to-heart -heart conversations with African women and girls, you know, in all their diversity and start asking ourselves, you know, what is this um, COVID-19 pandemic? Why is it really hearty? Um, opening our hearts and having very candid conversation and asking each other, what is it that we want? Yes, governments have started open, you know, spreading lockdown, lockdown, because that's the response for COVID-19, lockdown. But how inclusive has that been lockdown? who's been left behind, the women who are pregnant, the women who are nurses and doctors who have to go for shifts, the women who are going to labor, for instance, the women who will menstruate because lockdowns do not know that menstruation has to stop. So being able to go to the nitty gritty and opening those conversations and say, why is it hurting most? And what is it that we need to do? And mobilizing ourselves and coming together and speaking truth to power and say, yes, do the lockdowns, but make sure that they're also inclusive. Make sure that even when you're constituting the teams, the leadership teams that are thinking through in terms of this lockdown, do we have the representations of women? Do we have the representations of young women? 
We were actually one of the first um, organizations. We put what we call the Pan-African Women's COVID uh, platform. So this is an online platform where we were saying, usually when we have disasters like COVID, we had disasters like Ebola with HIV. What is important is for women to tell their stories, to have a platform where they can actually be able to document what they are going through, but to also use such a platform to demand um, what we are calling just recovery. Feminine has been really, really successful fundraising for uh, for women's rights organizations because we work with our member and part of the, our work is to find money to be channeled to women's rights organizations. And we have done that work quite successfully. I think now we have more than 30 uh, partners across the continent who are receiving resources from Feminine uh, because Feminine has uh, brought them together, has done the work of writing proposals, fetching and negotiating with donors. It's been amazing to see that in the last uh, four years, Feminet has been to reach uh, more than 2,000 women, civil society organizations and young women, as well as teenage girls with data. Uh, evidence that they have used to engage with policymakers at national level. They have presented, you know, petitions, they have presented statements, they have presented um, requests and, and drawn attention of specific policymakers to pay attention to the needs of women in countries like Uganda, uh, we have countries like Zambia, we have countries like Rwanda, we have um, Tanzania. Kenya has been outstanding because they have they started this work in 2017 and they have been rolling out the data-driven advocacy work. They have been able to influence even the National Bureau of Statistics, for example, to be able to take gender data seriously, to develop, for example, guidelines for uh, what we call the citizen-generated data. So I think one uh, of the things that I would say is an impact and we are really proud of is uh, being able to see new voices and see new faces in policy spaces because in the past it has always been um, those who work for teenage girls are the ones who are in these policy spaces influencing the policies. But the girls who are facing the direct effect of, for instance, the discrimination, uh, the discriminative norms, FGM, child marriage, have not been in the picture. So at least we have been able to see teenage girls uh, driving the agenda influencing the policies that are affecting them. The impact of this program is that men are changing. The change that we are seeing in communities is beyond what we thought. And uh, we are only uh, giving an example uh, on where we have worked, but there's a lot of prospects using the men to men as a strategy in uh, transforming attitudes and belief that, beliefs that um, perpetuate uh, gender-based violence or all harmful cultural practices in Africa. We want to see that uh, the laws that have been put in place, the reforms that we have made, there is enforcement of laws. Especially in the area of gender-based violence, we still see a lot of uh, problems with issues of gender-based violence, increasing levels of gender-based violence or sexual violence. We want our member states to implement laws that they have put in place regarding issues of gender-based violence or sexual violence. That is quite important because it is still a big issue. Then we also want to, to see the sustaining of the momentum of the, the gender, gender movement. Because if we sleep and think that everything is okay, we we'll wake up one day, Beijing, 20, Beijing 30, that we we'll, we'll see that going back, we have done better than what we are doing today. So we want to sustain this movement. How do we sustain it? Member states should also be willing to put in proper resources that we are seeing improvement every day.